Continuing with my mortality series, at what point do we consider a language to be dead, or extinct? I'm going to be discussing this process more in the at some point upcoming language birth language death video that is still being worked on, if you need the life updates in my Discord server. But basically, in this video, I'm not discussing the process of language death. We're talking about the point in time a language becomes dead and or extinct, and why I think we should get new terms for the types of dead or extinct languages. Traditionally, extinct languages are considered to be those with no native or L2 speakers left, and dead languages are those with just no native speakers. I do not like the term dead language, and I don't like how it is used alongside the term extinct language. Under the traditional definition, an extinct language is a Teocypriot. Nobody speaks it anymore. If you claim you speak a Teocypriot, I'm going to ignore you, because you don't. A dead language is something like Latin, which isn't undergoing a native speaker revitalization process outside of nerds, but it has L2 speakers. Then we have revived languages and living languages, but like, boring. My main issue with the terms extinct and dead is that, well, they work for dinosaurs, but not languages. Languages are flexible within those categories. Hebrew went from being a dead language to revived to arguably just being a living language. Old English went from being extinct to dead, and Eak went from being extinct to revived. We need new terms, and I'm going to steal some criteria from Vsauce. This is from the video Selfie Waves. I think you die at least three times. Once when your body stops living, again, usually sometime later when your name is spoken for the last time. But now, thanks to photography, more and more of us are able to save ourselves from the third, the last time an image of you is seen. I think this is a much better set of criteria. If you've watched Mortality and Language, you'll know I think it's appropriate to treat languages like living organisms, unlike dinosaurs, which are not living because they are all dead. But what are the language parallels? When the body stops living is when there are no native speakers left. When the name is spoken for the last time is when the language is spoken last. And the photographs of language? Direct written attestations. Under the traditional terms, we would call these dead, extinct, and lost. Let's get new terms. An unproductive language. In linguistics, a phonological or grammatical rule or process of word derivation is productive if it can still be actively used and not sound incorrect to the recipient of the utterance. An unproductive rule would be something that historically was acceptable in the language and only exists in the current state due to residual lexicalizations. I'm adapting this term for dead languages. Here, a productive language is one that is passed down to new native speakers, where language is allowed to undergo the natural process of language change. In an unproductive language, there is no natural language change from native speakers. In other words, this is a dead language, as any productivity or language change comes from L2 speakers. The original productive rules are gone. An unproductive continuous language may, however, still have productive rules, because the continuous signifies that there has been a consistent L2 usage of the language since the point in time in which it stopped being used as a native language. Examples are Latin, Coptic, and formerly Hebrew, which have all been used for administrative and or liturgical purposes since the loss of an L1 speaker community. Modern church Latin, for example, has taken on influences from Italian. So yes, there still may be productive grammatical and word derivational rules in Latin, but the speech community itself is unproductive. It is continuous, but it is still a relic of a historical process. I hope that makes sense. Unproductive non-continuous is basically the same thing, just that the language was not used as an L2 language at some point from the loss of its L1 speaker community. Because we have enough resources of Old English, there are people who can fluently speak it with each other. Sure, they have to adapt it to the modern world like Latin and Coptic, but again, the point is that the chain of the language being passed down to the next generation of the speaker community allowing for natural language change is no longer productive. And unlike unproductive continuous languages, nobody was fluent in Old English for like at least 700 years. Since these languages have L2 communities, they are by default revivable in some form. That differs from the cessated languages, which are languages that have ceased to have a fluent speaker community at all, L1 or L2. Formerly, we'd call these extinct. But extinct is a bad term because it implies that the language can never be spoken again, that it has no language photographs left, or that the speaker ethnicity itself has also gone extinct, which may or may not be true. So that's why I prefer the term cessated, 
because it does not imply that the speaker community is productive nor unproductive. It just doesn't exist anymore. So a cessated revivable language is a language that does not have an L1 or L2 speaker community, but has enough resources for us to theoretically bring the language back in a mostly original form. I would be comfortable putting Gothic here, for example. The tricky thing is when we have a very recent language cessation and enough material to revive it, we as humans usually get around to reviving it pretty quickly. If we can't do that, then it's a cessated, unrevivable language. We just don't have enough stuff to bring it back if we wanted to. This is a spectrum as well. Some languages might have a relatively complete grammar, but just not enough vocabulary to reasonably revive it without having to derive from a proto-language or just guess what words would be. We can't bring back Etruscan. We simply do not have enough words. There are then languages that we know exist from language photographs, like Ateo Cypriot, which we know existed due to a few bilingual inscriptions, and that's about it. Reading this Ateo Cypriot inscription shows us the face of the language, and yet without a lexicon or grammar, it may as well be completely lost to mortality, as are the thousands of unknown men and women from 19th century photographs, and yet they are not completely bygone. A bygone language has no living body, has no spoken name, and has no photograph to be seen. These languages have completely cessated, and their written evidence has either been lost to time or never existed in the first place. A bygone residual language is a language that is proven to exist through evidence that only survived in another language. Think toponyms, first names, or proto-languages that can be proven to be a valid grouping of daughter languages. We know that Proto-Uralic existed, maybe not the exact reconstructed form we have, but in some sense it was real. There is no speaker community, and there is no written evidence and yet there is still evidence elsewhere with the existence of the Uralic family. It is bygone residual. Ancient Belgian, which may or may not have existed, also goes here because there is enough toponymic evidence suggesting that it might have existed. Now, bygone unresidual would be the cases where there is no remnant linguistic evidence whatsoever of the language, but that language existed. The Thule culture, or a Proto-Inuit, have no genetic connection with the Dorset culture, whom we know of due to archaeological evidence. Those people presumably spoke a language. Is there anything that we know about it? Nope. Unproven proto-languages should also go here, in my opinion. proto denaean for example, could still arguably just be because of aerial or coincidental similarities between proto yenisean and proto nadene and thus not have true residuals. Or, for example, we know that there was a language spoken by the humans who settled Gebekli Tepe, but we don't know what it was. Hopefully my point is coming across. I also want to include one last category antediluvian languages. Languages so far gone that we will never even be able to hypothesize their existence. People groups who did not survive the tests of archaeology, or who were never distinct enough for us to pick up in genome readings of ancient bones. The languages that existed that are so lost, so covered by the passage of time, that they will never have a paper written on them even saying that there might have been a language spoken here. Descendants of a hypothetical proto-world that we will never be able to guess. Some are tens of thousands of years old. Some might be jungle languages lost and completely forgotten only a couple hundred years ago. They predate history, and they cannot be thought of. They are the most dead languages that there are. So, when does the language die? Does it die once when its last speaker dies? Does it die three times when it goes from productive to unproductive, and then to cessated, and then to bygone? Does it die seven times as it traverses through all these categories? Well, that's up to you to decide. I truthfully don't really care what the answer is. I just hate the term dead language so much that I decided to make my own classification system for the types of languages no longer spoken that completely circumvents that issue of when is the language considered dead. So I'd like to give a thank you to all my supporters on Patreon who continue to support me through these admittedly pretty rough times. So thank you to Agma Schwa, Real American Patriot, Albert Jones, Ayu, Babalingua, Andrew, Acorn, Alexis, Talatech, Benny, Cactus, The Gamer Potato, Eden, Elijah, Feta Fioka, John Costello, Obfuscable, Pirate, Stein G, The Wub, and Alan. Thank you guys so much. I've had a pretty whack time these past uh, eight months or whatever, so your continued support really, really, really means a lot. And um, yeah, thank you all for watching. That's all for me. Bye bye.